So you're all aware of some of the advantages of endovascular interventions. Obviously, oftentimes you can do those with local anesthesia and some sedation. There's no incision involved, often done on an outpatient basis, and patients go home uh, the same day and have a very short recovery. The Achilles heel is the durability of endovascular interventions, and this really depends on which bed you are treating. If you're treating the uh, iliac disease, more proximal lesions, typically you're going to see longer-term data, uh, two, three, four, sometimes five-year data. But once you go to the infra-inguinal distribution, uh, you're no longer uh, going to see uh, much long-term data. And if you see it, uh, it's uh, very few patients who are achieving that long-term durability more so in the infrapopliteal uh, distribution where the durability there continues to be a significant issue. So one of the decisions that you have to make uh, when you are evaluating someone with peripheral vascular disease is, is when to treat, and this is uh, really dependent on the presentation and the symptoms. For patients with claudication, uh, you're typically going to treat them if they fail medical management or if they are severely disabled. You don't really have a whole lot of a choice for patients with critical limb ischemia Short of a primary amputation in a dysfunctional patient, you have to treat those patients with uh, ischemic rest pain, ulceration, or gangrene uh, with some form of revascularization. Acute limb ischemia is a vascular emergency, uh, and uh, you don't really have also much of a choice there. Uh, if the patient continues to have a functional limb, you have to offer them some form of revascularization. So for patients with claudication, the general approach is that uh, you have to try to offer them conservative management as a first line, uh, medical management, exercise therapy, or, or whatever your routine is. The disease burden is typically less, and oftentimes you can get away with treating the more proximal lesions first, the iliac or the common femoral, and that typically may be enough to relieve their symptoms. As a general guideline, if you're treating uh, the iliac, uh, balloon expandable stents can be uh, useful for orifice lesions, but you can also use self-expanding stents in the distal iliac uh, and, of course, in the SFA or popliteal distribution if necessary. If they have common femoral profunda disease, this is typically a surgical uh, uh, type of revascularization, and if you treat that, again, this is often sufficient to relieve their symptoms, even if they have more distal uh, occlusion in the SFA or popliteal. So the goal there is to resolve their symptoms and not to convert them to critical limb ischemia. Uh, and you have to always keep in mind the limited durability of some of those interventions. And you rarely have to do a tibial intervention for patients with claudication, if ever. And this is perhaps because the durability of tibial interventions is not very good. The, the, the recurrence rate is very high. The conversion to critical limb ischemia is, is, is an issue. Uh, what are some of the tibial interventions that, uh, that can be done? Well, we're limited in, in many ways in the U.S., but, but by what's available to us, and uh, uh, it is typically in the form of an angioplasty or an atherectomy. Uh, stenting doesn't really work very well in the uh, tibial distribution, and it is reserved for bailout uh, uh, indications. Uh, and as I mentioned, again, you can see how the durability uh, is quite limited. So what is the best or better strategy uh, for below the knee intervention. Uh, again, it's limited by what's approved and available in the United States. Uh, um, in Europe, however, uh, you can offer them drug eluting technologies because some of those balloons uh, are available uh, and some of those stents that are coated are available. Uh, the data there is still not uh, quite uh, widespread. Uh, drug eluting technology seems to improve durability but is not perfect. Uh, some of the limb outcomes in patients with critical limb ischemia continue to be questionable, uh, so more data is needed uh, to decide whether this, uh, uh, those devices offer a significant advantage for CLI and below the knee interventions. So how do you plan your, your case? Uh, and uh, uh, you've seen some of that information in the previous uh, couple of talks. You can often sort of figure out what you want to do and what you're doing just based on your history and physical exam and the non-invasive vascular lab testing. So you feel for pulses. If they have femoral pulses, more likely than none, then the iliacs are going to be open. You can determine what the level of disease is based on your ABI and your PVR tracings. Uh, some uh, practitioners will routinely get uh, CTA. I, I don't really do it in my practice, but it can be certainly useful if you cannot feel a femoral pulse. Uh, and uh, uh, it's good to know whether they have uh, extensive aortoiliac occlusive disease uh, to plan your procedure. 
Anti-grade access uh, from the ipsilateral common femoral uh, can be very useful if you're treating distal disease uh, in the uh, infrapopliteal location because it affords you more pushability. It oftentimes will avoid a hostile bifurcation and you can typically complete the procedure with a four or a five French sheath. However, retrograde contralateral common femoral access is more commonly performed, at least in the vascular surgery world. And if you do so, uh, you have to bring your sheath all the way down to where the lesion is. is. So don't, don't uh, be shy to use a longer sheath, a 70, 80, 90 centimeter sheath, uh, up and over the aortic bifurcation all the way down uh, to where uh, your lesion is. Brachial access can be feasible and useful in certain circumstances. It is limited by, by multiple uh, issues, uh, whether it's access site complication or device length or pushability, but it is certainly uh, an option that you can keep in the back of your mind. How do you cross a lesion? Typically, you can do that with just standard wire and catheter techniques. Uh, I cannot emphasize the extra support, bringing your sheath all the way down and using support uh, catheters. What wire you use, you're going to have to sort of establish your own preference and routine. You can do so with an 035 or an 018 or an 014 system. You have to be familiar maybe with one or two wires uh, from each uh, uh, type. Uh, that will be your go-to wire, maybe for simple lesions and maybe for CTOs. Uh, so there's uh, multiple devices that are available on the market. Uh, and uh, be familiar with uh, one or two of each type that uh, you will go to uh, uh, for your interventions. If you cannot cross a CTO using standard and wire uh, catheter and wire techniques, there are some crossing devices. And again, be familiar with a couple of them. Uh, you're not going to necessarily stock all of them at your institution because they're costly. Uh, but try to be familiar with what you have, uh, be it the crosser device or the true pad device or the laser catheter that you can utilize uh, uh, with the step-by-step -step technique. If you are in a subintimal plane and you're trying to re-enter into the true lumen, uh, again, be familiar with a couple of re-entry devices, uh, whether it's the outbag or the anterior or what have you. Uh, newer technology include uh, the ocelot catheter uh, that can help you sort of navigate your wire through the subintimal plane. Uh, it may be useful for quick lesion uh, crossing because you can sort of visualize where your wire is going and you can potentially cross quicker with uh, less, less radiation exposure. The retrograde pedal approach is another approach that can be useful in patients with uh, critical limb ischemia, uh, especially in those high-risk patients who have failed uh, typical anti-grade recanalization. It is typically useful for flush SFA or uh, tibial occlusion, uh, again, distal popliteal occlusion that uh, extends into the origin of the tibial vessel, so you don't really have a nubbin to navigate into the uh, tibial. Uh, patients with a failed anti-grade recanalization and who are at a high risk for a surgical bypass. To illustrate this, this is such a, a case of a 93-year-old woman who had uh, toe gangrene, uh, occluded SFA, occluded popliteal, uh, and uh, she had a tibioperineal, uh, tibioperineal uh, trunk stent right here. Anti-grade recanalization failed because we were in the subintimal plane and could not uh, get back. Uh, because of the multiple comorbidities, we decided to offer her a retrograde uh, approach, sticking the perineal at this level and trying to recanalize the stent uh, uh, as such. And this is the 018 wire going through the stent, through the popliteal occlusion uh, at the level of the knee. Uh, and this is following uh, angioplasty, uh, establishing inline flow to the foot. So once you cross the lesion, how do you treat it? Well, uh, as you're going to see when you get into practice or in your training, there's multiple tools and devices and gadgets and gizmos, uh, which tells you that really none of them is perfect. But you're going to have to, at some point, try to establish your routine based on your interpretation of the data and based on what's available to you, uh, be it uh, with angioplasty, uh, different types of stents, or atherectomy catheters. So different tools and uh, devices and options. Plain old balloon angioplasty uh, probably affords you the least durability uh, in terms of patency compared to what's available uh, nowadays, um, certainly for patients with critical limb ischemia. However, very long balloons are available, uh, 250 centimeter long, which can be useful in certain uh, situations. 
Stenting, self-expanding stents are typically what you're going to use if you decide to stent in the intra-inguinal distribution. Uh, long stents are available. Uh, balloon expandable stents typically you're going to reserve uh, for uh, uh, the iliac or aortoiliac distribution. Uh, they are quite useful in uh, orifice lesions and when you need high uh, radial strength. Uh, and they can uh, afford you very precise deployment, such as in this case where the iliac was occluded, you really want to nail it right at this level, short of doing kissing balloon angioplasty and stenting, uh, so you can nail it here with a balloon expandable stent and sparing the uh, contralateral iliac system. This is uh, uh, infrainguinal uh, uh, popliteal angioplasty and stenting. Peripheral atherectomy can be done uh, with uh, different tools that may be available uh, on the market, uh, excisional, rotational, or laser atherectomy. Uh, typically, you're going to require with atherectomy an adjunctive procedure, specifically when uh, you're using uh, laser atherectomy and sometimes uh, rotational atherectomy. Uh, you're often going to have to complement that with balloon angioplasty uh, and sometimes uh, stenting, uh, whether you're using it uh, for de novo disease or for instant restenosis. This is uh, another picture, again, of a laser-assisted uh, uh, peripheral angioplasty. One thing to keep in mind is some of the data following atherectomy. Uh, yes, it works, uh, but in patients with critical limb ischemia, uh, the rate of limb salvage and the patency may not be significantly better than it is with other device modalities. Uh, so when you're trying to make a decision, keep in mind uh, some of the complications that can come with it, such as embolization and the costs associated when you're trying to make a decision as to what device to use. Other devices that can be used in the SFA or popliteal distribution include a covered stent. Uh, as you uh, may know, uh, uh, Viabon has, uh, the Viabon stent has uh, undergone significant iterations over the past few years. Uh, it's heparin bonded, the contour has been uh, changed, uh, so the durability has been uh, improved to some extent based on some of the uh, recent trial data. Uh, this is what uh, it oftentimes uh, looks like, uh, sort of a, an endovascular FAMPOP type of bypass. Uh, so the, uh, uh, the data from uh, uh, some of their trials show uh, improved patency with the new devices uh, that can be oftentimes comparable uh, to other stents, self-expanding stents or uh, drug-coated stents. The one thing to keep in mind is that you don't want to keep doing the same thing over and over again in patients who keep coming back uh, with uh, recurrence. Sometimes you have to make a decision that maybe conversion to a surgical bypass is what you need to do. Uh, sometimes uh, you should just switch to another endovascular modality. If you used a bare metal stent or just a plain old balloon angioplasty to start with and you know it doesn't really work in your practice, then you may have to consider some of the uh, current uh, devices that may be available. Uh, and some of the current technologies that may offer an edge over the traditional devices include, as I mentioned, the heparin-coated covered stents, uh, the, some of the self-expanding stents such as the uh, superior stent that has SFA and popliteal indications uh, and has shown some improved durability in the popliteal and the SFA. Uh, the tigris stent that has recently been approved, uh, which is a gore stent, has also an SFA and popliteal indication. Uh, how is it going to perform in, in clinical practice? We don't know yet, but uh, again, it shows uh, uh, improved durability compared to, to the uh, typical stents. Some of the drug eluting technologies that you're going to see available to you in the uh, U.S. include the uh, Silver PTX uh, stent and some of the uh, drug eluting balloons, uh, such as the Impact Metronic balloon and the Lutonix uh, BART balloon, uh, that have shown significant uh, improved durability at least in one year with patients uh, uh, with claudication compared uh, to plain old balloons. Angioplasty. So keep in mind uh, some of those newer, maybe more expensive technologies, but they certainly can offer uh, some advantages in terms of uh, durability uh, for patients with uh, claudication. Promising technologies that uh, you may see uh, become available in the U.S. at some point include uh, the uh, bioabsorbable vascular scaffolds uh, that uh, may be useful sometimes in the SFA palpiteal and maybe in the future in the tibial distribution. I've mentioned the uh, Tigris stent, which has been approved. Uh, we'll see how it's going to perform in clinical practice. Uh, some of the uh, uh, newer balloon expandable stents, the heparin bonded balloon expandable stent, the trial has been completed, uh, and uh, uh, hopefully uh, the 
the device will be released uh, on the market soon. Uh, and some devices that can uh, hopefully minimize the rate of resinosis, such as the bullfrog catheter, which is sort of a catheter with a needle tip that allows you to inject steroid in the subintimal space as you're crossing, and hopefully that can mitigate some of the inflammatory response and neointimal hyperplasia. So in summary, there are numerous endovascular treatment options that are available, at, uh, as you've seen. Uh, you have to sort of make your own decision as to uh, what the data means to you and your patient population and what devices you have uh, in your armamentarium. Uh, you have to put a lot of information together to decide how to approach a lesion, starting with the, the patient, the indication, the presenting symptoms, the comorbidities, uh, the location of the disease, uh, the expected durability, uh, and the cost uh, when you're making your decision. Thank you very much. Thanks, Toby.